I'm sure it's fine. I'd like to start off with uh, a question. It's, does anyone have a favorite utility library like uh, Lodash or jQuery or something like that? Who uses Lodash? Underscore? Knockout? That's cool. Isn't it great that we have this community that we can use all these different features and different libraries if we want to and nobody can tell us that we can't do it and there's like no single company that controls our community? Except, do we really need this many ways to iterate over an array? Do you even know all the ways to filter an array in underscore? Is it the same exact version in Lodash or is it, I think it's slightly different depending on which version you're using. Do you even know all the JavaScript standard library functions? What about the ones in ES6? I don't think Brendan even knows all the ones in ES6. Pretty sure. Let alone all the libraries on top of it. It's not that a library is too big. It's pretty cool. Every library is pretty cool. It's, it's, it has some nice features, nice extensions. The problem is that we have a lot of them. And each one has a lot of different functions. And the total amount of APIs that you have to learn to be productive in this industry is huge. And it's way too much to learn. So what happens when you get a new team member coming onto your team? How many special utility calls do they find in your code base? And how much ramp up time do they need to figure out what's actually going on there? So why do we actually use JavaScript to begin with? It's not the best language in the world. There's, regardless of what style you prefer, there's at least one language that's better that can compile to JavaScript, except JavaScript is everywhere. This is why we're using it. It's at least something that a lot of people could agree on, and our industry needs a baseline to build on top of. So JavaScript is one of those baselines that we can build on top of. And using a standard comes with a lot of benefits, like information is accessible, tooling, people to hire, and so on. So by introducing divergence in the library community, we're actually undermining what makes JavaScript great. We're already creating an environment where you can't hire a JavaScript generalist anymore. You have to hire a JavaScript specialist in a spe specific library. At Facebook, we have a very simple story. We use JavaScript's standard library. There's one way to do things, and it's the standard way. We don't have an underscore. We don't have utility libraries. And it avoids a very simple problem, bike shedding. It's the biggest waste of time of all. We still have to do that, but we keep that to the standard mailing list. And most of it is arbitrary anyway, so it doesn't really matter that much. So why is our industry still using so many JavaScript libraries? Well. The standard library is pretty small, and it doesn't have all the features that you may want. But many times, the answer is just write a little bit more boilerplate code. It takes you a few seconds longer. You don't take on a dependency. The person coming to fix your code later after you're left, or if you're busy in a meeting, they don't have to learn some obscure functions or 20 other versions of the same functions that someone else thought was slightly better than this one. One of the best uh, lessons that I've learned at Facebook is that no abstraction can actually be better than a wrong abstraction. And especially since abstractions build on top of each other, they're difficult to unwind. So proving that a general abstraction is worthwhile can actually be quite difficult. And teaching it to an, our entire industry is even more difficult. It takes time. And this is the reason why standards are slow. You may want JavaScript to copy a feature from another language, but once you look at a lot of different languages, it's not really clear which one is the best one. And you have to figure out which one is the best one, because picking the wrong one is highly risky, because our entire industry will have to figure that out. But there are some features to a language that are really powerful, and we really need them. And we really need them as soon as possible. The problem is that even after there's agreement on the value of a specific feature, 
there's still a long process before it's actually implemented in browsers. So there's a proposal, there's standardization, initial implementation, mainstream browser support, and then the long tail of browsers, right? And once the browser implements it, it's too late to take it back. So engines actually optimize for correctness and compatibility before speed, performance, or early implementations. That, that's why the availability looks like this, because for browsers, it's way too risky to implement something way too early. But that's not really what adoption curve looks like, because third-party libraries don't have this restriction. They uh, get adopted before the standard is even proposed. Uh, the industry has already learned them by the time there is a standard. And at the end of the curve, we have uh, support for new uh, language features. But by the time the new language feature occurs, and it's available, there's already 10 libraries that have the same feature. And now you have to learn t those 10 libraries plus another language feature. This is the point when people are starting to have a strong reaction against standards, because they already have the feature. They already have the, the possibility to do this. And they don't want to learn one more thing. At Facebook, it looks something like this. We use small experimental libraries. We roll it out slowly. Unless you really need it, you're, you're not going to use it too much. And when there's a standards proposal, we quickly roll off our experimental libraries and use polyfills instead, even before the standard is filed. So most developers won't actually see these 10 different things of doing things. They will jump straight on to the standards version. And I'd like to see this happening more in our industry as a whole. So why aren't we all using just polyfills. So it, it's not that easy, actually. There's a few problems with it. Uh, the primary problem of adopting too early is that standards actually change uh, a lot during the process. Um, polyfills was, uh, differ slightly in various ways. Um, libraries have these problems as well with inconsistencies between versions. So often you never, never actually notice this, but it does become a problem when you have third-party code that depend on the uh, changing standard and the various versions of polyfills. And one of the reasons this is a problem is because most built-ins are on a global object or on the prototype. And you can only have, real realistically, you can only really have one version at a time. And different libraries may depend on different edge cases that can't be used together. So if they go unfixed for a long time, which they actually do, unfortunately, in a lot of polyfills, more and more code starts relying on a particular version of a polyfill. So it's very important for these polyfills to stay up to date, but also the code that uses them to stay up to date. But you can package multiple versions of Arden scores with your app. It's, it's not ideal, but you can. It's much more difficult with a polyfill. Another issue, which is similar to the one we brought up earlier, um, is that some people like to discourage polyfills because they might actually break the spec. And I'll explain what happened with string contains. So this was another era long before ES5 and the new wave of standards. Uh, it was before Guillermo had facial hair. Where are you? So Guillermo and I was working on a framework called Mutools at the time. So Mutuals was extending the built-in prototypes with some extra helper functions. And we did this this way. We checked if there was an existing function. And if there wasn't, we introduced our own one. So what happens when the browsers try to implement this feature? The new version comes in, and it replaces the Mutuals version, which means that the website that relies on the Mutuals behavior breaks. So luckily, we learned our lesson with Mutuals 1.3. So instead of overriding them conditionally, we unconditionally override any built-in version. Except the built-in version has an enumerability flag set to false, which means that you can't loop over the property to find it. So what happens with the second statement? It no longer copies 
the object if the browser ever implements this feature. So this is actually the reason why the browsers refuse to implement this. So they're, they're, they're both fixed in newer versions of Mutools. Um, but Mutools was a popular library back then, and a lot of websites have deployed this version. So we, I guess we could just break them, except nobody's working on them anymore. There's no consultants working on these websites. So if a browser int introduces this feature, it will break the website, and people will start using another browser. So whoever br browser is the first one, it's going to lose out. And this is the classic browser game theory problem. No browser wants to be the first one because they will lose customers. So this is why a bad polyfill could potentially risk breaking the web and actually breaking the future standards that they're trying to polyfill. However, this is not just a problem with code that mutates the prototype. Um, I found this this week in React. We actually checked that a string object doesn't have a key property. So if a browser ever implements a key property on a string, they might break old versions of React. And I picked two examples from libraries that I've been involved with, but I'm not the only one doing this. I'm not the one, only one screwing up. This is pretty easy mistakes to make. But as you can see, it's not just if you try to change prototypes. It happens in libraries all the time. And we just rename contains to includes. It's not a big deal. Browser specs will have to find a way to work around this. It's not a reason to, not to, to avoid using polyfills. There's a common misunderstanding that native functions are always faster than the polyfills or library features. That's not true. So naive polyfills tend to use the native implementation if it's available. But then you can end up with the same problem that Mutuals did, right? If the ch spec actually changes, then uh, people using your polyfill might actually break the spec. And additionally, early implementations are often very, very slow. They're not optimized for speed yet. They're optimized for correctness because it's high risk for a browser to introduce a new feature. So they have to make it correct. So the solution is to simply just always override the native implementation until way into the long tail of browser support. So for new syntax, this general solution is to compile your modern code down to an older version. You're not modifying the runtime, so you don't really suffer from the same versioning problem. Uh, you can ship different versions of, of uh, pre-compiled code. However, transpiling tools suck. I mean, they're great. They're, they're efficient, and the, the setup is fairly easy. However, people have an very strong reaction to that extra compilation step. People don't like compilation. For production, it doesn't really matter that much, to be honest. Like, you have a minifier and packager anyway, so plugging in a compiler in your pipeline isn't that big of a deal if it's fast enough. And at Facebook, we're working very hard on making these tools fast enough. However, looking at the long tail of the JS ecosystem, support for new language features is actually pretty bad. But this is strictly a tooling problem that we can solve. If you use a well-supported and frequently updated parser, then linters will, will work with that. And what happens is that these tools tend to die off when they don't support the new features. They get replaced by other ones anyway. And compilation isn't really an inherent problem to, to this uh, transpiler situation. Browsers could have first-class support for transpilers, or you can make a browser extension that do it, or you can make a, an operating system extension that makes it easy to just open any file and have it transpile it. Compilation happens anyway in the browser. It, it happens within the runtime on the fly, so why shouldn't we be able to do that on the fly with a client-side transpiler as well? 
one problem with the current solutions is that there's way too many options out there. Having too many options can actually be a bad thing. Um, getting the polyfills right is very difficult, and various polyfills depend on each other, and when they overlap, they might, might not be compatible with each other in slightly different ways. So I would recommend using like a full end-to-end -end solution. And it's not, having too many choices is not actually a good thing in this regard because people avoid using polyfills because it's so difficult to set up. So you actually want something that is easy and just works out of the box. Polyfills as a service is one of these new easy phenomena. Um, it only really works on runtime polyfills. It's uh, pretty easy get, to get started. There's still kind of a lot of configuration options. Um, but there's also a single point of failure, which means that if the CDN updates or goes down in the future, in the long term, then you might break the website. And that's, that may seem like a bad thing. And for your clients, this probably is. But for the rest of us, it's actually a good thing, because you can't accidentally break the future of the web. It's the right spirit, though. Like, I've enumerated a lot of problems here, and they're all solvable. We just need to start building a cohesive story around polyfills and buy into it from the end-to-end -end stack. Some people think that polyfills is a temporary hack that we don't really have to focus on. It's uh, something that we use now to, to get rid of uh, older browsers eventually, but we won't. As long as the web is evolving, it's not an ad hoc hack. It needs to be a natural part of all of our tool chain. And if your tool chain doesn't support the bleeding edge polyfills and transpilers, you might actually be left behind. So all the major uh, UI frameworks have announced intentions to design their new versions and their new features with ES7 in mind. Not ES6, ES7. And this is because all the new frameworks buy into this story of having polyfills and and adopting new standards very early. Another thing that's showing up is all these uh, new type systems making their way into JavaScript. They all have special annotations. And if you want to use the, the type annotations, you still need some kind of compile step to strip them out, because they will realistically not be standardized anytime soon. It will take a long time to standardize these type systems, because this, the TC39 doesn't want to standardize an incomplete type system. They want a complete solution to be standardized, so, which means that these annotations will live on for a long time without supporting the browsers. Ideally, we don't want to end up in a situation where every framework has its own language and, and depends on a certain set of transpilers and polyfills. It's natural that every framework cares a little bit more about certain features than other features, so they, they will try to jump on a particular transpiler or a particular uh, polyfill. But this is a configuration problem that doesn't affect most developers and in their day-to-day -day life. Uh, but it's everyone's responsibility to sort of cooperate and try to move towards a unified JavaScript so we avoid the situation with uh, divergent libraries. But using j just JavaScript doesn't necessarily mean that you have to use all of it. So JavaScript already has a very large surface area. And if we want to add more features to it, we need to remove something so that we can learn the new features. And the new people coming into our industry doesn't have to learn all the legacy that comes along with it. So linters, strict mode, VM optimizations, they all discourage certain behavior, certain JavaScript features. They can never be removed and unsupported. But they can be removed from our industry's mental surface area in the sense that you don't really have to know them to be productive in our industry. So don't use the crazy parts of JavaScript just because you can. And hopefully, we can get to an adoption rate that looks something like this. Thank you.